Welcome class to Advanced Aircraft Systems. I'm your instructor, Tom Mahoney. Welcome to lecture number eight. This is uh, going to be flight control systems. Let's get started. And here we go. Flight control systems on the CRJ 700. The following review of the CRJ-700 flight controls will be broken down into the following topics. Systems overview, roll control, pitch control, yaw control, slats and flaps, spoilers, and stall protection. Flight controls are grouped into primary and secondary flight controls. For you, uh, Cessna 172 folks, uh, you should have learned, at least in your uh, private pilot training, the primary flight controls are ailerons, elevators, and rudders. Secondary flight controls, uh, slats and flaps, aileron trim, rudder, and horizontal stab trim, and spoilers. Those might be a little bit newer terms to you. Uh, let's take a quick uh, look at what we're talking about. Slats are on the leading edge of the wing. Spoilers are uh, control surfaces located on the top sides of the wings. You have a couple different types of spoilers. You still have your flaps. You have your ailerons, pretty common stuff you should be familiar with. And then back here, we have a horizontal stabilizer. With this. this is the whole surface right here. Then you have your elevators on the back. And finally, none but not least, you have your rudder on the vertical forward uh, vertical stabilizer. So there you have it. Those are the uh, basic surfaces. Now we're gonna talk about how they function on the CRJ-700. Conventional controls on the flight deck are used to control the flight attitude of the aircraft. So the same thing you have seen on your Cessna 172, you will see on your CRJ-700. You have flight controls up here and uh, how they operate your uh, primary flight controls uh, pretty much the same as uh, any aircraft, make them go up and down, but here's how it's accomplished by transmitting pilot inputs through cables, push rods, and a power control unit, a PCU. That'll be something new for you. In uh, turn, the PCUs hydraulically position the control surfaces. So if you take a look here, uh, all these little items right here, one, three, and two, and three, and one, two, and three, those are all individual PCUs. The number designates which hydraulic system is powering uh, that particular PCU. So you can see on the uh, uh, rudder here, we also have PCUs. So PCUs are commonly used to control the primary flight surfaces of the aircraft. Secondary flight controls uh, yeah, are operated by the aileron rudder trim panel, the stab mock trim panel, the yaw damper panel, slats and flaps, lever, emergency flap switch, ground lift dumping switch, flight spoiler lever, and stall pitch switches, stall sw uh, switch lights, roll disconnect, and pitch disconnect handles. And... Uh, PLT and uh, cockpit uh, rolls uh, like switch uh, lights. So here we go. Let's take a look at them. These are the pictures of a kind of expanded view and large views of the different panels that we just uh, mentioned here. So for example, this panel here uh, is a panel that depicts the uh, aileron trim and the roll trim. That panel is located right down this area. Let me just go ahead and get a pin brought up here so we can annotate this stuff here for you. So this panel right here is found right down in there. Then we have the uh, mock, uh, the stab trim and the mock trim uh, switches. And those are going to be necessary for you to control the aircraft. That is found right down in this area. Then we have the yaw damper and uh, switches. 
Those are found, I believe this is it right down here. And then we have the ADG control. That's the uh, flap emergency switch. And that should be located, uh, something I don't uh, mess with very often. Should be located, I think somewhere up in here, but uh, we'll come back and look at that a little bit later. Of course, you have your flap slat selector here, which is right there on that side of the uh, center panel. And then you have these interesting little things. These are your roll disconnect switches. Uh, or levers. These uh, actually disconnect one side of the aircraft from the other side of the aircraft in terms of uh, your control wheels. So that one's right here and the roll control is right here. In the normal position, roll control is in the horizontal position and in the normal control, pitch control is in the vertical position. Okay, let's get rid of some of these lines here a little bit so we can make more room. Then we have the uh, stall pitch control switch. That should be uh, stall pitch control switch. I believe that's right over here on this aircraft. And we have the spoiler controls. And that is right here. So I think uh, we pretty much got everything. ADG, there we go. Found the ADG right in the obvious spot, it is right down in here, okay? So if you wanted to uh, select the emergency flap switch, you would have to look all the way down to the bottom of the panel. Not something I'm going to be looking forward to doing. We have one last other switch up here, and that's the spoiler switch. And I believe that may be actually right down here. So anyway, uh, you look around the cockpit, you get familiar with it, you figure out where all these switches are, and eventually uh, they become uh, fairly familiar with where they're located, and then we can go ahead and continue. Secondary flight controls are operated by, uh, on the control wheel, that's what we're really talking about here, these are the switches located right here on the control wheel right in this area. So we have the stabilizer trim switches. Uh, that is going to be right here. You're going to have the stab uh, trim disconnect switches right up in here. A lot of people get these confused and until you operate them, you have the autopilot disconnect right here. Uh, a lot of people get those switches confused I think they're uh, pushing the uh, push to talk switch. And the next thing you know, they've disconnected the autopilot by mistake. So uh, something you can't really get too familiar with until you get in the aircraft, put your hands on the control wheels, wrap your fingers around the different switches, figure out exactly which finger is going to uh, do what. And that way you'll get a little bit more familiar. I've flown aircraft, uh, jumped in them, be beyond the approach, get ready to disconnect the autopilot for some reason or you know disconnect something and uh, end up disconnecting the autopilot going, oh, I didn't want to do that. Now I'm in a pickle because now I got to hand fly the aircraft all the way down to the runway or maybe five miles out. Something I wasn't maybe intending on doing, but you end up uh, doing it to yourself and you take care of the situation as necessary. So now we have uh, synoptic pages. Uh, provide information on the flight controls and the and the status page also does this. So uh, all these little pages that you can pull up uh, uh, up here, let's go through those real quickly. Um, I'm gonna highlight some of this stuff, there we go. So uh, this particular view here of your flight panel uh, shows you the status page. And on the status page, you'll see that uh, we have a takeoff config uh, annunciation right here. It says takeoff config OK. That means everything's positioned uh, where it needs to be, the trim and the flaps, that kind of stuff. Uh, just prior to takeoff, you'd glance at that. And if that wasn't there, you would not want to take off. You'd want to 
go back and check, see what uh, see what you may have missed on your uh, pre-flight or your uh, briefings uh, with each other. Uh, this area right in this uh, spot um, indicates uh, the trim position of the aircraft. Uh, right here, 6.4 shows what the uh, pitch indication or the pitch trim is set to. Uh, here, the rudder is indicated in neutral. You have nose left, nose right, and aileron uh, left and right. Of course, it shows neutral at that point. So that's the status page. That's the page you're actually going to be on most of the time. Coming on over the same uh, same screen, you can push the flight control switch down on the synoptic uh, panel, and uh, you can pull up and actually see what the ailerons are doing. Uh, and the, for example, here are the ailerons. You can actually see what they're doing. And you'll see the indication here going up and down. Uh, hopefully those arrows are going in the opposite directions when you twist your control wheel right or left. And it gives you a position uh, for the flaps, actually tells you they're flaps eight in this case. And these slats, leading edge slats, when the flaps are eight are going to be at, uh, at 20 degrees. It'll show you when you operate the control wheel, uh, what the uh, boards here on top of the wings, the uh, spoilers are doing. Uh, then of course, uh, you can see uh, if the captain's checking his rudder out, he'll see uh, this indice move left and right. Uh, and of course, if you're operating the control wheel, doing a control wheel check, you'll see the uh, indices here move up and down for the elevators. And again, we have, uh, the same thing we saw previously on the status page, now on the uh, flight control page, just more indications of what the trim is doing. Don't be overwhelmed. All this stuff becomes uh, pretty automatic. Uh, over here on your engine ICAST uh, page, uh, ICAST number one, um, <clears throat> which shows shows you the <coughs> shows you the uh, engine instruments. Also gives you enunciations uh, on the ICAST as to what might be going wrong. In this case, it's uh, saying, "Hey, we've got a an elevator split uh, situation or a mock trim uh, indication." Uh, so we'd want to be taking a look at mock trim or stall fail warning. And these are in amber, so we'd want to go ahead and get our QRH out and see how to deal with that particular or those particular in types of indications. Now, finally. Uh, and most importantly is that uh, you could pull up on the hydraulics page uh, in your, on your synoptics uh, panel. You could pull up the hydraulic pages and it will actually tell you what flight controls are powered by which hydraulic system. Now this is really kind of important. Uh, we'll cover this in hydraulics anyway, but you have, this is hydraulic system number one, this is number two and number three. I'm so gonna reinforce that, I'm, I'm sorry. I may have said that wrong. This is number two over here. And then we have number three here. Okay, so those are your hydraulic systems. There are three hydraulic systems on this aircraft. Hydraulics for this aircraft are critically important because they control your flight controls. Uh, they're so important that they've dedicated each hydraulic system to be able to power independently these same three primary flight control surfaces. So you have the rudder, the elevator, and the ailerons uh, are all there. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, left aileron is controlled by the number one system, and the right aileron is controlled by the number two system, and the number three system actually controls both left and right. So that's how important the hydraulics are on this. Without hydraulics, this airplane is not controlled. So whatever happens, you do not want to lose all your hydraulic systems or you would be in a real pickle. Well, let's get back to the right page. There we go. Okay, so let me see if we've covered everything over here. Uh, failures, oops, let's go back. When a failure, uh, when a flight system failure occurs, the ICAST messages are dis displayed to alert the pods. Well, there you are. There's the uh, there's the alerts right down in here, uh, and that would be on the status page. 
Roll control, let's talk about that for a second. Exactly how do you uh, control roll on the CRJ700? Controlled by control wheel inputs to the ailerons and the uh, spoilers. Ailerons are positioned by the PCUs, which are power control units, and are hydraulically powered by high or powered by hydraulics. And we've talked about that on the previous slide. So the left uh, PCU is powered by uh, the the left PCUs, I should say. All, all of these over here. Let's go down here and circle. These are the PCUs that uh, control the left aileron and they are controlled by hydraulic uh, system number one and hydraulic system number two, three, as you can see depicted here, one and three. The right is, uh, again, uh, gets its power from hydraulic system number two and number three. So any of these PCUs can operate their associated uh, flight control panel. An aileron damper prevents aileron flutter in flight and on the ground, it acts like a gust lock. So this little guy right down in here, that is a flutter damper. Okay, we got the same thing over on the other side. That little guy lives right there. So there's your uh, there's your gust uh, lock and your in-flight uh, um, flutter damper. So finally, we have what we call Spoilerons, the spoilerons live right here. Okay, these are spoilers. These are called flight spoilers in some cases. These guys right here are not flight spoilers. They're ground lift dumping devices. So <clears throat> those come up uh, when you land and uh, if you've got them armed, they'll automatically come up with a uh, uh, main gear spin up uh, normally. So they'll pop up, reduce the lifts, keeps the aircraft on the ground so you don't end up having a bouncy landing. But uh, spoilerons, on the other hand, live just outboard on each side and they help uh, the aircraft roll left or right. Uh, they come up from the top of the surface, create uh, a downward force on the top of the wing and create drag and thus help uh, pull the nose around to the direction it's actually turning. So we try not to use the uh, um, rudders quite as much as you might be used to. Uh, the aircraft turns pretty well without a lot of rudder in input. So that was the uh, aileron control or the roll control, I should say. Uh, let's talk about what happens uh, if uh, in the event of a jammed roll control system. So aileron controls uh, from each control wheel is uh, interconnected by a torque tube mechanism. So that torque tube mechanism is right here. So it goes across and locks the uh, control wheels together so the control wheels operate in unison. Okay. In the event of a jammed aileron, uh, that affects roll control, the pilot would disconnect the torque tube. This here, we put a, we just disconnected. We do that by turning, pulling up and turning the roll disconnect lever. So that now the uh, torque tube is disconnected from left to right, and now the control wheels operate independently. Now, why would we wanna do that? Well, let's say, for example, in this picture that uh, the first officer's control wheel became jammed, jammed somewhere along its system. So maybe uh, maybe their uh, pulley jumped, a uh, cable jumped the pulley or a push rod got hung up somewhere. And uh, if we didn't disconnect this, we would not have the use of the uh, left side control wheel to continue to control the aircraft. That would not be a good thing. So we would want to disconnect uh, the two via this torque tube. So in this case, what would happen? Now the captain's side uh, is in control. The captain's side is going to control his onside uh, aileron. And it's going to control his offside spoileron. And in this case, 
this would be out of service and this would be out of service. But we can still achieve some level of roll control with the aircraft. Probably gonna reduce it to about half because we've only got half the control surface available for roll control in this configuration. The same thing uh, if we, uh, if the captain's uh, control wheel or control linkages somehow got uh, jammed up, then we would uh, disconnect the, uh, the torque tube and then the first officer's control wheel would be in control of the aircraft. And of course, when that happens, uh, spoiler on roll control would be enunciated and also a caution, not a master warning, just a caution. So we know that we've got a situation where we have split the controls. So when the control uh, are split from each other, one control wheel or the other is commanding the aircraft to roll through its respective ailerons and opposite sides spoiler. Now, the pitch control, let's talk about that for a second. Uh, we have a uh, pitch control is achieved by elevator and uh, trim provided by a movable stabilizer. Uh, each elevator is hydraulically controlled by three PCUs. So just like the ailerons, we have these things called PCUs back here that control the elevator. Here's our elevator. And this side, uh, these PCUs control its respective elevator. And then on the right side, we have the PCUs uh, controlling its respective elevator. So if something were to happen to uh, the captain's side of the aircraft on his, say something jams up, we can twist the uh, pitch control uh, disconnect lever and get rid of that uh, torque tube. And now the first officer's uh, flight controls would be able to operate his side uh, or his elevator side uh, we wouldn't care too much about the uh, captain's side because if the controls are jammed, we don't want that moving around. So they would be centered and paired to the uh, uh, horizontal stabilizer. And then the first officer's elevator would now control the pitch by itself. Of course, without the uh, disconnect in there, they'd be connected. And of course, both control units would have to move aft and forward at the same time. So that's why we use the pitch disconnect. Let's say we have a loss of hydraulic power. Dampeners prevent uh, the flutter of the elevator. So let's say we lost uh, hydraulic power, one, two, and three. The, we have some flutter dampeners right here, just like we had on the ailerons. Wait, these are right in here. That's going to hold that uh, elevator from fluttering up and down. Well, of course, that, at that point, we're going to be controlling the uh, pitch with trim, which is doable. I would imagine I would want to have to try to land an aircraft doing that, but I guess it would be uh, a last resort. We would have no options. If one side or the other of the uh, elevator becomes jammed, the pitch disconnect, well, we've talked about that. So uh, we'll talk about how the trim on the uh, elevator or on the uh, horizontal stabilizer uh, works. Next. There we are. Pitch trim. So pitch trim, this is something you may have not seen before if you're coming from a Cessna 172 or light aircraft. Uh, pitch trim isn't, uh, doesn't have a little tab on the behind the, uh, uh, the elevator. The whole horizontal stabilizer moves up and down. And I guess the best way to tell you about this, I'm just going to draw it in here. Uh, so you can see back in this part of the uh, elevator, right up in this area, would be a pivot point. So that's a pivot point. And the front uh, of the stabilizer can go up and down. Now, how does it do that? Well, it has this jack screw right here. This jack screw is attached right at this point, right in that area. And there's a nut right in here that turns when these are motors right here, motor one and number two, when those motors are turning, uh, it moves this jack screw up and down. And therefore the leading edge of the 
horizontal stabilizer would move up and down uh, and pivoted back at this point. So that's how we achieve the trim control for pitch. And uh, let's uh, just talk a little bit more about how this uh, operates. Um, what you're really doing when you're changing this, uh, the leading edge uh, position of the stabilizer, you're changing the angle of incidence of the horizontal stabilizer. So it changes relative to the uh, changes relative to the relative wind, uh, and uh, applies downward pressure or upward pressure on the aft end of the aircraft. The stabilizer jack screw repositions the leading edge of the horizontal stabilizer and is driven by two electric motors. Repositioning is controlled by a split trim switch on each of the control wheels. So on your flight control wheel, you have two little switches. They're really close together. If you don't look at them real close, you'd think they're just one switch. But each switch operates either motor one or motor two respectively. So you want to be pushing both of those little switches back and forth. And you'll do that instinctively because you won't be able to tell uh, which switch you're on. You're just going to push them both at the same time. Okay, channel one and channel two switches are located on the uh, stab trim panel, uh, must be on for the trim system to work. So uh, as we saw in one of the earlier slides, we have uh, a panel over here. Right over here is actually a mock trim uh, button, but uh, these two switches we'd want to have turned on so that we would have a uh, stab trim available. So uh, we could get enunciations on the ICAS that would say st uh, stab channel number one. Uh, this is uh, like uh, the status of it. Uh, stab uh, channel one is inoperative. We'd come down here and we'd push that switch to get this enunciation to go away. Uh, and of course, uh, we might see something like this, where it says stab trim inoperative if uh, one of them uh, failed. So we get this coming on, we get that coming on, and then we'd go to the QRH if we see a, a yellow enunciation or amber enunciation like that and follow what the QRH said to do. So that's kind of how those work. You wanna make sure you have your stab trim switches on uh, so your trim control works properly on the earth. Runaway pitch control, one of my favorite subjects. I uh, actually had this happen to me once uh, as a first officer I was flying, and we had what was finally determined to be a runaway pitch control. It wasn't quite like they taught us in the simulator, so we actually didn't recognize it as being a runaway. It was very insidious and uh, didn't, uh, didn't function quite to uh, do the things that they told us it was going to do. Uh, just one of those things that we had to deal with it anyway, so we did. But it's an interesting story. If we have time, I'll tell you about it. Maybe I'll tell you about it anyway. Uh, <clears throat> with the autopilot on and the stabilizer trim is operating more than three seconds. So let's say you've got uh, the autopilot's on, so the trim is going to operate automatically. In other words, uh, the, <clears throat> the motors here are going to be controlled by the autopilot and it's gonna be repositioning this uh, horizontal stabilizer. Well, if this stabilizer, um, the motors are running for more than three seconds, a clacker is going to sound. And that's going to alert you to, hey, you've got a runaway stabilizer and you need to do something about it. Now, fortunately with this aircraft, um, if, it, uh, if you get a runaway stabilizer trim, a brake, two brakes, one on each motor, will lock up those motors and stop the runaway from happening. Uh, so three seconds, you're gonna hear a clacker and hopefully shortly thereafter, the brakes are gonna come on and lock up uh, that uh, those motors so the uh, jack screw does not turn anymore. And voila, hopefully you're safe. Brakes on the trim motor should be engaged to prevent further movement of the horizontal stabilizer. So just talked about that. So that's what happens. Uh, You'll get a little enunciation right down here on your uh, flight to flight panel that says, hey, you've got an issue with your trim. So uh, anyway, I'll tell you the story here real quick. Uh, so uh, 
I was uh, flying an aircraft, uh, uh, 737, uh, taking off from San Antonio, going to Los Angeles. And I was the first officer and the captain on board, of course. And uh, we were on our takeoff roll. We rotated uh, uh, normally. And as soon as we get off the ground, about three or 400 feet, I go ahead and I start trimming manually uh, just to make the aircraft do what I wanted to do, make, and make the controls feel soft in my hands. And uh, the trim didn't work. We have another feature on the 737 called um, speed trim. And when the autopilot's off and uh, the landing gear and flaps are configured for takeoff as you're in the air, uh, the speed trim will actually automatically trim the aircraft for you. But I'm, I'm one of these guys who don't want to wait on speed trim, so I would trim it automatically myself. Well, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, I didn't have any input in the trim with my trim switches. I looked over at the captain, and we got about to 4,000 feet. I said, hey, and by this time, the aircraft's all cleaned up. Uh, speed trim is no longer supposed to be operating. But the trim wheel kept turning intermittently like if speed trim was engaged. And I finally asked the captain, I said, Captain, do you, do you have a trim control on your uh, control wheel? And he tried it, and he said, no, I don't. And I said, well, we got an issue here because uh, it looks like speed trim is still engaged somehow. We didn't know how that could possibly be because the flaps and gear were up and uh, we were clean. So we should have been able to manually control the uh, trim. Um, but in the uh, training that we received, the trim uh, wheel would be operating continuously, like him going and uh, we would not have any input into it. So if we had no input and it was continuously operating, that was called a runaway trim. In our case, it wasn't going, it was going, and then it would stop. A few seconds later, we go, and it would stop. And we're kind of puzzled because that's exactly what uh, speed trim looks like. Uh, so we uh, misdiagnosed it and uh, we continued to fly up. The trim got more and more out of whack. And uh, finally, uh, I asked the captain if he'd take over the controls while well, I readjusted my seat. And uh, he took the controls and he says, well, I'll tell you what, why don't I just fly it? Because we're not going to continue on to um, Los Angeles like we had planned. We, we both agreed we're going to go back. And so, of course, I have to go ahead and do the work from there on, uh, getting our FMS set up for a return back. And uh, I thought it was kind of funny because I'm, I'm sure the captain was a little hesitant to want to jump into the FMS and try to switch that stuff around because it's not a common uh, practice that we do. And he, he probably just probably couldn't remember quite how to do it. And he said, I'll, I'll just fly the airplane. You run that computer box for me. And so that's what happened. And uh, we got back, we got the aircraft reconfigured for landing and the aircraft uh, appeared to be in trim with the reconfiguration and we landed normally. So it was a interesting event, uh, but uh, something we actually misdiagnosed because it wasn't the way we were trained. So uh, the rule is a pilot will always react based on the way they're trained. And that's exactly what we did. We reacted based on the way we were trained and we had no clear, concise checklist that was driving us to do the right thing. So we just basically had to cowboy that situation and brought the aircraft back safely. Mock trim. Well, mock trim is a, a phenomena on these uh, high-speed aircraft uh, where what happens uh, is the center of uh, pressure which some people refer to as the center of lift or a lift vector moves aft on the uh, on the wing. So in other words, if this is your center of uh, pressure, what happens, the faster you go, the more aft it moves. So the lift vector ends up being back here instead of forward. Of course, if this is the center of gravity, what happens is the nose wants to tuck down. And to compensate for that, the horizontal stabilizer is repositioned by your mock trim compensator. So that uh, big jack screw we were talking about in the previous slide, it's going to start turning and pulling the leading edge of the stabilizer downward, changing its angle of incidence so that what can really happen is now you have a downward force here increasing and this downward force is also increasing as a result of the uh, lift vector on the wing moving aft. So 
the mock trim is actually compensating for you to help you maintain control of the aircraft in the uh, in terms of pitch. If this did not go down and you kept increasing your speed, what would happen is the aircraft would eventually do what we call tuck under or do a mock tuck and the nose would go down. Of course, if the nose goes down, what's gonna to happen to our airspeed? It's gonna increase. What's gonna happen when the airspeed increases? Our uh, lift vector is going to even move farther aft and uh, end up uh, exaggerating the issue with uh, more nose down tendencies. And eventually you're gonna run out of stabilizer trim and you're going to do mock tuck at that point in time. Uh, something we don't want to happen. That's why we do limit the speeds of these aircraft. Um, we uh, just don't let them get going so fast that we can never uh, control the uh, pitch in flight with our horizontal stabilizer. So once you exceed that uh, speed, you would get yourself in serious trouble. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. And uh, it would be a ride that you don't want to take. Yaw control, just like on your Cessna 172, I'm gonna move my face here out of the way so we can see what's going on here. So you have a vertical stabilizer that's going to be in this area right here, just like on your Cessna 172, and you have a rudder right here, okay? So what does the rudder do? It corrects for adverse yaw. Well, the nice thing about a jet is we don't have as much adverse yaw as you would on a light aircraft, okay? But how is it controlled? Now let's get rid of our lines here and talk about some more BCUs, power control units. Again, uh, number one is the hydraulic uh, system number one, number two is hydraulic system number two, and of course three represents hydraulic system number three. So all three uh, hydraulic systems have input. If you lose one or two hydraulic systems, you always have a third system you can fall back to uh, and you can lose hydraulic systems. So that's how critically important they think uh, the hydraulic system is, is they have three of them and these PCUs then, uh, PCUs are going to end up controlling the deflection in the rudder. So that's how it does it. The difference is between the ailerons and the elevator is that you have no disconnect lever if your controls get jammed, but uh, the rudder would have a tendency to want to uh, flare to the neutral position if it was jammed. At that point in time, both rudder pedals are still gonna be operable. It's just gonna take more pressure to move the rudder than it did before. So that's the big difference there, that's the takeaway, but still the rudder is controlled by uh, hydraulic pressure from three different hydraulic systems. Now, this is interesting uh, because there have been accidents as a result of uh, mishandling the rudder. So they've put limitations on the rudder. So uh, at low speeds, you have full, de full scale deflection of 33 degrees. Uh, so the rudder can move when you're going slow uh, all the way across this range right here. Okay, well, if you're going slow, you would want that uh, range of movement. When would that occur? Well, when you're doing your approach to landing or you're taking off, you're not going as fast as you normally would be going uh, in cruise flight. So you might need to have more rudder input because the rudder is less effective at slower speeds. However, as you increase in speed, you have a rudder travel limiter that reduces the range of motion from 33 to four degrees. Now, uh, that's a good thing. Regardless, whatever you do, you do not want to, and this is, that's this note right here, you do not want to rapidly move the rudder from left to right full-scale deflection, uh, as that can put unnecessary stress on your vertical stabilizer. So, yeah, this can happen, and you can actually, if you overdo it, 
with your rudder pedals, you can snap your uh, vertical stabilizer right off the aircraft, which is exactly what happened several years ago. And I don't remember for sure. I believe it may have been a seven, uh, seven th uh, 757 or a 767 that departed from either LaGuardia or Kennedy uh, behind a, a heavy aircraft that was no doubt uh, going slow. They were clean. They were heavy and going slow, which created a lot of wake turbulence behind that aircraft in front of the aircraft in question. The first officer who was flying the second aircraft got into the wake turbulence. The aircraft started to yaw left to right and do some funky things. And the first officer was slamming the rudder from left to right and uh, basically broke the whole rudder or the vertical stabilizer right off the aircraft. Uh, that did not uh, result in a, a good ending for that uh, particular flight. Uh, so, yeah, they crashed as a result. Uh, so uh, regardless of whether you have a limiter, a rudder limiter on these aircraft or not, be judicious with the, the amount of force you place on those rudders, rudder pedals, uh, because there are limits. Uh, in fact, I took off one night. I'll tell you another little story. One night, uh, seven, 717, I was the first officer, took off of... Uh, Let's see, it was uh, actually, it was in Boston. We took off from Boston and uh, we were behind a heavy Airbus that uh, was heading over the pond and it was in front of us and it made a left turn out over the water. We made our left turn out over the water probably about three minutes later and uh, somewhere out over the water, uh, we got in its uh, wake turbulence and no doubt by that point it had cleaned itself up uh, it was clean, slow, and heavy because it was an overseas aircraft, fully loaded. And we got an into its wake turbulence, and the aircraft I was flying started to roll uh, to the left. And so I put in full aileron control to stop the roll, and the aircraft continued to roll. And uh, so at that point, I said, well, uh, I'm looking out the captain's window. I can see the uh, reflection of the waves. Uh, in the moonlight and I'm going, well, this is not a good place to be. So I remembered this story about uh, the uh, 757 uh, breaking the uh, uh, stabilizer off and I put in rudder pressure, but I did it very, very slowly. And finally I reached full deflection. My foot was all the way down to the ground for a floorboard with the uh, right rudder. And at that point in time, the aircraft came out of a 90 degree bank angle and finally went from here to here finally got it reestablished and flying again the way we wanted it to be so that's the, that's the message don't jump on the rudders too hard or you could end up damaging the aircraft or worse okay uh, now we're back to rudder trim. So rudder is apparently, you know, this is kind of an important feature of, of an aircraft, right? They don't don't fly very well without rudders on. So rudder trim is controlled by rotating the rudder trim switch uh, to the nose left or nose right position. The switch is operated electrically to provide hydraulic power to the rudder surface. Uh, although the rudder is repositioned, the rudder pedals remain neutral. So uh, when you're turning the rudder switch right over here, left to right, rudder pedals don't move, but you are actually moving the rudder electrically. And so it's being deflected. Uh, you'll have some indication on your uh, trim settings uh, on your uh, flight panels to show you how much deflection you actually have. Now that's a spring loaded switch. So if you let go of it, it always pops back to the middle. So the motors, uh, where the electrical power stops being provided to continue the deflection. So wherever you put it, uh, that's where it's gonna stay until of course you put it, uh, retrim it back to the neutral position. Uh, that's about it on that. Let's move on to the next one. The yaw damper. Now this is a rather interesting phenomenon, especially with swept wing jets. Okay, this is where it usually occurs. Um, I'm just going to tell you how, how this happens. First of all, uh, you have a yaw damper, which prevents 
uh, unnecessary yawing of the aircraft. In other words, uh, you do not want the nose to move right or left in level flight. However, on a swept wing jet, because the swept wing is back here, uh, they have a tendency to want to uh, yaw regardless. And you as a pilot cannot keep up uh, correcting for it. Uh, it just happens too fast. And eventually you get into what we call uh, a Dutch roll. So let me see if I can explain this to you a little bit more. Let's say the nose, uh, nose moves to the right. That's going to bring this leading edge up here. So the aircraft is going to end up doing that. The leading edge of the wing is going to end up doing this. And this leading edge is going to end up going back here like this. Well, the relative wind is going to hit this wing and cover more of a surface area here. And while the wind is coming down from this direction on the opposite side, it is only going to cover a distance like that. And as you can see, my two vector lines here, um, one is shorter, the one on the right side is shorter. So therefore, there's less drag on the right wing in this configuration. And what happens? Well, because there's left drag on the right side, more drag on the left side, the nose of the aircraft then has a tendency to want to move in the opposite direction and pull the aircraft to the left. And then it would pull it all the way to the left where we have exactly the opposite situation where we'd have more drag now on the right side of the aircraft and then on the left side, and then it would want to move to the other direction. And if that happens rapidly, you get yourself in this Dutch roll, and uh, you can not, at some point in time, continue to control the aircraft effectively. It can actually, at altitude, roll over upside down, and you lose control of the aircraft. So we have a device called the yaw damper. And no, not yaw dampener, yaw damper. See, it just spelled D-A-M-P-E-R. So that's damper. So don't get made fun of uh, by calling it the yaw damper, dampener. That's a yaw damper. So you have a couple switches in the cockpit that uh, turn the yaw damper on. And if that's off, you'll get an enunciation. And you don't want to be flying around like that. Uh, it was noted on the uh, 7 2. When I was an engineer, they talked about this a little bit. The 7 2 was particularly notorious that uh, if you didn't, if you lost your yaw dampers, uh, it would go into a Dutch roll rather quickly at altitude. And the rule was uh, if you did lose your yaw dampers, you would, uh, what they said was simply slow down and go down. So what you wanted to do is you wanted to head to more dense air and uh, the rudder would be more effective for you. Otherwise, what the yaw damper does is actually moving the rudder back, back and forth rapidly, uh, more rapidly than you as a pilot would be able to recognize and trying to do it. And it will keep the aircraft traveling straight through the air preventing Dutch roll. Let's talk a little bit about slats and flaps. Slats and flaps are operated by the slat flap control lever on the center pedestal. Moving the slat flap lever signals the slat flap uh, electronic control unit to provide automatic posi positioning of the slats and or the flaps and leading edge slats. The flap selector handle is limited in travel by gates at positions 8 and 20, so you just can't move the handle freely all the way the length of it, uh, you have to actually uh, have uh, pushed the uh, lever up and down to get it to go past those uh, positions, the eight and 20 position. This is done just in case you are on approach, you've got full flaps fully configured. And in case you had to do a go around, uh, you would bring the uh, flats and flap levers up to uh, flaps eight uh, to start out with, and then uh, eventually to flaps one. So you just didn't bring the uh, flaps all the way up to zero, end up getting yourself into a stall. So that's why they have these gates 
uh, on the uh, selector handle. Um, <clears throat> so where are the uh, slats that you're operating? Uh, well, the slats are, are on the leading edge of the wing. The flaps are these guys right back here. Actually, all of these guys back here and on both sides, of course. So the flaps and slats do not necessarily operate in unison. When you position the flap lever to the one position, the only thing that happens is the slats come out to the 20 degree position. When you move the slat handle, uh, flaps and slat handle to the eight position, what happens is the slats remain at 20 degrees and the flaps uh, extend to eight degrees. So we'll talk about that here as we look at the next slide. <clears throat> so slats and flaps are uh, electronically posi uh, repositioned electrically in the move something here that's in my way, not so much in your way. Uh, when the uh, flap slats lever is positioned to one, only the slats are extended 20 degrees. The slats uh, remain at 20 degrees until <laughs> the flap uh, selector handle is positioned to 30 and 45. Uh, the flaps move from uh, the zero position to eight degrees when the uh, handle is selected to the eight degree position. So up until that point, uh, the flaps remain at zero until you get to the eight. The flaps then move to the course uh, to correspond to the lever position up to 45 degrees of flaps. So there's your eight degrees on flaps. There's your 20 degrees on flaps, 30 degrees and 45 degrees. And at one, you get 20 degrees of slats. Here, we'll put it over here. So now the slats come out here. And uh, let's see, the uh, I believe the slats then uh, go to 25 degrees uh, when it hits the 20. This is a little, yep. Uh, let me uh, zoom in on this if I can, get a little better look at it here. There we go. Uh, there's a, a good chart to show you exactly what's going on. So uh, lever position, in other words, where we're positioning the actual lever, if it's positioned at uh, zero, everything's fully retracted, both slats and flaps at zero. Uh, flaps are fully retracted. And uh, right, uh, one, slats are extended to 20 degrees. Flaps remain retracted at eight. The flaps go eight. The slats remain at 20. At 20, uh, flaps remain at 20 degrees. Flaps go to 20. Then when you position the flaps to 30 degrees, slats go to 25 and the flaps go to 30. And then uh, 25 is the limit on the uh, slap position at 45 degrees. Slats are still 25 and flaps go to 45. So you can see that uh, they don't necessarily operate exactly the same way. You can use that to your advantage when you're flying. Uh, say if you're doing a descent into Atlanta and uh, you uh, had quite a ways out there to keep the deck angle of the aircraft level so the flight attendants can actually push their carts around in the descent, you wouldn't want to point the nose down or they're going to be working on a slope in the back of the aircraft. You could actually just uh, go to position number one, give yourself a slash 20. That's going to keep the yell. Uh, deck angle of the aircraft level, and yet you'll still lose adequate amount of altitude, and the flight attendants can finish up their service on a level platform in the back. Uh, so things like that you learn how to do that's uh, maybe a little more advanced than you need to know at this point in time, but good information to know for later on as to why. Okay, we have the emergency flaps, uh, slats and flaps uh, switches. So let's say in an event of a mechanical failure, the slats and flaps can be extended using the emergency flap switch on the center pedestal. 
with the switch uh, placed in the deployed position, the slats will drive to 25 degrees and the flaps will drive to 20 degrees. So if you deploy the uh, switch to See if I can get my, there we go. Got my pencil back here. And to get back on the right slide, here we go. Okay, so um, the emergency flap uh, switch selector is placed in the deployed position at a speed higher than VNE. Guess what will happen? Nothing will happen, okay? The flaps will not go out. The control unit will delay deployment of the slaps, slats and flaps until the speed is reduced. So this is your emergency flap uh, switch uh, down there at the bottom end of the uh, center console. You can push that down and uh, then you will get your flaps to extend uh, 20 degrees and your slats will extend 25 degrees, except unless you are exceeding the flap uh, flap slap speeds of the aircraft, then an electronic device says, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do it yet. Slow down and then try again. And then eventually the uh, flaps and slats will come to the, uh, the positions of 25 and 20. Spoilers. There are two types of spoilers on the upper surface of the wing. There are multifunction spoilers and there are ground spoilers. Multifunction spoilers provide the following. They assist in roll control and they do proportional lift dumping in flight. In other words, what that means, the farther you twist the control wheel, the farther upward the multi uh, function spoilers will move, creating more uh, reduced lift and drag on that particular side of the aircraft that uh, the boards are being operated on. Uh, then you have uh, those same spoilers will uh, provide uh, ground lift dumping when you land, so they'll all pop up. So let's take a look at exactly what we're looking at, talking about. Talking about these guys right here on each side of the aircraft. So the, if you remember what we talked about earlier, the, the left side here is controlled by the uh, right side control wheel. Uh, these guys are controlled by the left side control wheel. And the farther you move the control wheel, if they're still interconnected, it doesn't matter uh, with the torque tube. Uh, the farther you move the control wheel, uh, for example, if I move the, uh, the first officer's control wheel or if they're interconnected still, either control wheel, uh, moving it to the right, uh, what will happen is uh, moving it to the right, these spoilers will move upward proportionally, create some drag and reduce the lift, and uh, these will stay paired with the surface of the uh, top surface of the wing. And when you're rolling to the uh, left, then the right spoilers go down flush to the wing and these go up proportionally to the amount of roll that you've placed on the control wheels. Okay. Then um, you can also use these in flight uh, for um, dumping lift. You have your spoiler lever. If you pull your spoiler lever out, these uh, these flight spoilers here will both come up and uh, dump lift off the top of the wing. So now you can increase the rate of descent without increasing the speed. And you can also put some more drag on the aircraft if you need to slow down. Uh, say you're going faster than you want to be going, you need to slow down to make a certain crossing that was out in front of you. You could just simply pull, reduce the power, pull those up. That uh, That's what we call uh, selecting the boards, okay? So these are kind of like boards out there, just creating drag. And once you land, if you have the spoilers armed, then uh, you touch down on main wheel spin up, 
of these spoilers will pop up, reducing lift. And at the same time, so will these spoilers. So all of these guys come up when you land. And in that case, let's talk about the ground spoilers, provide the following. Uh, these are the uh, ground spoilers on the inboard side here, right there. Those are the ground spoilers. Uh, they're only used for uh, ground uh, lift dumping, so they're they're only operable on the ground. We can't operate them in the air. If they did, we'd lose a lot of lift in a hurry, much more than uh, would be acceptable. So. Flight spoilers uh, are used to reduce lift, and we've talked about this a little bit already. Uh, we'll go back through it here real quickly. So when you are operating the uh, uh, control wheels, just to make it a little more clear, you're operating control wheels. Uh, these, uh, if I'm turning to the right or left in this case, these boards would uh, pop up. These would stay fared to the surface of the wing and uh, vice versa. If I want both sets of spoilers to uh, come up, uh, and in other words, I'm using flight spoilers at this point in time, I would use the, I would pull the flight uh, spoiler handle here and uh, pull that back to any position along here. I'm going to get pr proportional uh, lift dumping uh, because both sides will come up. And uh, the limitation on using these flight spoilers in this manner is that we not normally, well, we definitely would not want them to be extended when we're on the approach and below 300 feet. The reality of it is, uh, depending on the company procedures, they may not, uh, they may limit you from using the flight spoilers anytime the flaps are down. Because once the flaps go down and then you start using this, you have a big gaping hole right in this part of the wing and you're going to end up losing a lot of lift, and it may be not be desirable according to policy for that particular company to do that uh, when you are on final approach. So that's a limitation that you might want to be aware of. Uh, you would see the movement of these flight spoilers if you brought up your synoptics page. You'd see the, the movement here based on these little arrows here, how far up you have them. Uh, those are little vector, vector arrows. The longer they are, the further up you have your spoilers above the wings. So that's how you could see. Normally, you just kind of feel the aircraft when you're flying. You wouldn't necessarily go to that page. That's just good information to have. But... Okay, let's uh, get close to the end here. Let's talk about this. The stall protection computer. SPC. So, uh, as you uh, approach a stall, let's uh, let's say you're getting the nose way too high. You have a computer that let me see. Yeah, there it is. Uh, stall protection stick shaker. This is what's going to happen. You get the nose too high. You're going to have the stick shaker come on. So let's talk about this for just a second. Stall protection computer. The SCP monitors angle of attack and lateral acceleration to compute your stall speed. So now, no longer like you learned on your Cessna 172 is a 17 degrees angle of attack where you're going to stall. Uh, this will compute your stall speed based on your angle of attack and your lateral acceleration. And that those two numbers combined give you a, a better stall speed indication. So that's what the computer is measuring is how well you can uh, or how close you're getting to an actual stall. So during a stall, what's going to happen is the red stall lights uh, are going to flash on each side of the panel saying, hey, guys, wake up. You've got a situation occurring that you're not going to like if you let it continue. You're going to get a warbler tone over the uh, uh, speakers in the uh, cockpit. Then the stick shaker is going to activate. That's the big one. So this uh, uh, flight uh, controls are both of them are going to shake violently uh, forward and aft, and uh, it's just going to be a continuous shaking. 
the autopilot is going to disconnect and saying, hey, guys, we give up. We tried to keep you safe. The autopilot was going to disconnect and continuous ignition, ignition on your engines is going to activate. Uh, now, that's what's going to happen initially. And if you don't do something to try to recover the aircraft, like push forward on the controls, add power at the same time, try to uh, lower the angle of attack and accelerate so that you can recover from the stall. If you do not do that, there's another device called the sp stick pusher, which is now going to activate. And that's literally going to move the controls forward. And uh, basically what it's saying to yourself uh, the aircraft saying to you, you're an idiot, I'm taking over. So if you let it get to that position uh, to where the stick shaker activates, that means you really did something serious, let alone just getting into a stall is serious, but not responding to it is even more serious. So that's when you are an idiot and the aircraft is going to take over. And that's it. Don't be an idiot. Recover from stalls when you get into a stall. Uh, other than that, <clears throat> flight controls is finished uh, for the time being. Uh, keep in mind there are three hydraulic systems that uh, keep these flight controls operating. We'll get into that a little later on when we get into the hydraulics. For the time being, love my job. Glad to be here. Hope I can make a difference. Have a great day.